Welcome to the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Rochester. For over 150 years, ours has been a church of open minds and loving hearts, celebrating many sources of wisdom, many spiritual paths, and many identities. Your faith, your doubts, your questions, your hopes for our world are welcome here. Our doors are closed because our hearts are open, living our values of care and compassion for our community. You can stay connected online through our services and Sunday coffee hour, summer groups and forums. Find more on our website in your weekly e-news, or you can contact our staff to get connected. Each week, our offering goes to support people within and beyond our church. This week, our collection is shared between supporting the general mission of our church and providing emergency financial assistance to members and friends through our Human Needs Fund. We're collecting for that often because the need is great. If you or someone you know in the church needs assistance for groceries, for challenging bills, or other things, please contact myself or the office so that we can be supportive and helpful, and please give generously. You can give at uurochmn.org slash give. Thank you for your generosity. In the words of the Reverend Eliza Tupper Wilkes, minister of this church in the 1870s, may our faith in humanity and our message of hope and good cheer light our way. It's good to be together. This is the Unitarian Universalist Church. This is the church of the flaming chalice. This is the church of the open mind. This is the church of the loving heart, where friends come together and share. Good morning. It's been 49 days since George Floyd was killed in the par par Powderhorn neighborhood of South Minneapolis. In that time, we have seen a nation rise up and demand change on a variety of levels. My family has spent many a summer evening asking each other how our privilege is contributing to systemic oppression and racism in Rochester, the United States, and even the world. The discussions have often been lively and intense, and sometimes I wonder what the neighbors might be saying about us because, let's face it, all four of us can be pretty obnoxious and loud at times, especially when our emotions get going. Our conversations typically come down to what we are doing or what we are going to do to be accountable to our neighbors and friends of color. Jim Wallace, the evangelical Christian minister and founder of Sojourners, has labeled the time we are going through now as a kairos moment. Kairos is a Greek word meaning a right, opportune, or critical period of time. We are at a critical, we are at a critical moment, a time we can't afford to waste. We have an opportunity to do something amazing right now. In the coming weeks, city councils and state governments will be bringing forward concrete policies designed to create structural changes that will abolish institutions that are repressive 
and create new ones designed to restore dignity and love in our communities. We need to let go of our fear and anxiety and work with them, embracing our imagination and looking into what is truly possible. We can create a criminal justice system that focuses on restoration, not punishment a police force committed to caring and serving all our citizens, and a healthcare system designed to facilitate the health and well-being of entire communities on all levels. Everybody. I hope you're enjoying this beautiful, if not a little bit hot weather. I've been thinking a lot lately about sometimes when I see things going on around me that I don't agree with, but I don't really know how to say anything about it. So that's what our story is about today. The Smallest Girl in the Smallest Grade Written by Justin Roberts, illustrated by Christian Robinson Hardly anyone noticed Miss Molly McCabe. She was the smallest girl in the smallest grade. Sure, her name could be heard in the daily roll call and she marched with her books down the same school hall, but hardly anyone noticed young Sally McCabe. And they certainly didn't know, or at least didn't mention, that Sally was paying super extra special attention. To the abandoned kite with the tangled string. To the 27 keys on the janitor's ring. To the leaves as they turned green to gold in the fall. To the time Tommy Torino was tripped in the hall. She watched as the wildflowers tipped toward the light and heard the howl of a hound dog late one night. She was there when the stray cats who normally fought conducted a meeting in the church parking lot. She saw Kevin McEwen get pushed off a slide and the oncoming tears that he wanted to hide. And she'll never forget that parent-teacher day when Billy's much larger father suddenly dragged him away. But through all the mean words and all the cold stares, no one ever noticed that Sally was there. And they certainly didn't know, or at least didn't mention, that Sally was paying super extra special attention. She'd seen how a whisper could make someone cower, like a bulldozer crushing through fields of wildflower, and it kept piling up this discarded debris, those beautiful kites tangled in trees. So on February 3rd at 1129, Sally stepped straight out of the lunchroom line she said, I'm tired of this seeing this terrible stuff. Stop hurting each other. This is enough. Now a few kids laughed out loud or didn't care that there was some girl with her hand in the air. 
But then something super extra special happened that day as Howard O'Henry suddenly set down his tray. Like waves rolling in one after another, first Molly rose up, then Michael's twin brother. It was Tyrone and Terrence, then Amanda and Paul, who pushed out their chairs and stretched their arms tall. From the friendly lunch lady with the dishes she carted, to the new third grade teacher who'd only just started. Yes, everyone there, even Principal Claire, had joined little Sally with their hands in the air. And though hound dogs were destined to howl at night and most stray cat meetings would end up as fights and kites would continue to get stuck in trees, they all felt for a moment like the janitor's keys. Fastened together with a heavy steel ring that held all the secrets to unlock everything. As the world returned to the way that it was, Sally noticed the difference, as she usually does, when Billy paused briefly to open the door for Mrs. O'Connell and 17 more, or when Molly scooched over to make some space on the coral riser for Ellen and Grace. These moments that often get taken for granted a wildflower appearing that no one had even planted. The swings soon resumed with their rhythm and sway and the day turned to night and night turned to day. People remembered and would quite often mention that Sally had been paying super extra special attention and how the world could transform and a change could be made by the smallest girl in the smallest grade. So if sometimes you feel like you can't do anything, even though you're a kid, I mean, I know some adults feel that way too, say something. It'll often at least bring to attention stuff that's going on and maybe make others think about their actions. So take your time, think about what you wanna change and go for it. We are separated by space and time, but we are still together and we gather in a virtual way as we continue to create a place of communal caring and connection. Be enriched by the virtual presence of each other and draw yourself into the heart of love in this time of service and reflection. In this time, we ask that our minds be open, our hearts welcoming, our arms embracing. We honor all who support us in this caring, loving, and all-inclusive ministry. We send gratitude to Rhonda Lorenz, serving as our caring coordinator up until July 18th, arranging care for our members and friends in need. The members of our caring committee are wonderful examples of our compassionate community, holding us up as we go through challenging times. And as we continue through this time of staying at home, many of us may need additional care, whether it be pastoral care, grocery delivery or an errand run, and we encourage you to reach out to Reverend Luke or myself with that request. We thank all of you who have offered to assist our members with these requests, and we send gratitude to you all for serving our congregation during this time. In this community, we make time each week to share pieces of our lives with one another. We do this because each person here has value. Each person's experience matters. We lift up those whose lives are touched by sadness, by illness, by worry, or by loneliness. We revel in those who are celebrating joys in their lives. May their happiness lift us all. May all of us find comfort, hope, joy, and healing strength in this community. Please keep Claudio Rivera close in your thoughts. Claudio underwent knee replacement surgery early this week and all went well. He's recovering at home with his family, and wife slash nurse Bonnie. Claudio will have the other knee replaced in six weeks and we hold him in our hearts through this healing journey. As we have over these last few months, we need to continue to reach out to all in our community 
to let them know we are still here and still supporting them. We encourage you all to send cards and make calls to those you love and support local businesses, opening the doors of communication and community. May the faith in the spirit of life, love for the community of earth, and love for the light in each other be ours now and in all the days to come. I invite you wherever you are to take a deep breath. Breathe deep the breath of life. Slow down, even if for just a few moments, to remember how you are held. Above you are the ancient stars with their light. Below you, the ancient earth with its turning, holding you here between. Know that here in this community, you are named and known as beloved, as sacred, and hear that as many times as you need these days. And remember how precious breath is right now. I invite you into a time of meditation and prayer, first by sharing a few silent breaths together. Spirit of life and source of love, God of a thousand names and beyond all naming, these warm summer days that seem to almost stop time with their heat, to a world already seemingly stopped and held in time, we're stuck here between frenetic planning for uncertainty and forced idleness to be free of risk. Here. We are right in the middle, the air itself filled with slowness. Maybe it's what we need to really force us to slow down. When we're exhausted just by stepping out into the afternoon sun, to sit there if we're lucky, staring at the bird or the cloud or a loved one, marveling at every little movement of every little moment, Perhaps that's what our spiritual work has always been, slowing down just enough to notice the tiny miracles right there and to remember it's those that sustain us in these heavy, hard days. We hold all those who suffer in mind, in body, or spirit. I invite you to bring the names that you're holding in your own heart this day in joy or in sorrow celebration or concern and silently or aloud now in this time and space to speak their names. For all those names and many others, may we all be held in love and grace. These words of meditation come from Barbara Crooker entitled, How the Trees on Summer Nights Turn into a Dark River. How you can never reach it, no matter how hard you try, walking as fast as you can but getting nowhere, arms and legs pumping, sweat drizzling in rivulets, each year a little slower, more creaks and aches, less breath. Ah, but these soft nights, Air like a warm bath, the dusky wings of bats careening overhead, and you'd think the road goes on forever. Apollinaire wrote, What isn't given to love is so much wasted, and I wonder what I haven't given yet. A thin, comma, moon rises orange. A skinny slice of melon so delicious I could drown in its sweetness or eat the whole thing down to the rind. Always this hunger for more. May we find more and more beauty in the moments we find ourselves in each day. Amen.
The first reading are excerpts from Give the Police Departments to the Grandmothers by Yunata Petras. Give them the salaries and the pensions and the city vehicles, but make them a, a fleet of vintage Corvettes, Jaguars, and Cadillacs with white leather interior, interior, diamond in the back, sunroof top. Let the cars be badass. You would hear the old school jams like Patti LaBelle, Anita Baker, and Al Green. You would hear Sweet Honey and the Rock in the radio, harmonizing We Who Believe in Freedom Will Not Rest, bumping out the speakers. If you up to mischief, they will pick you up swiftly in their sweet ride and look at you until you catch shame and look down at your lap. She asks you if you're hungry, and you say, yes, and of course you are. She got a crown of dreadlocks, on the, and on the dashboard you see brown faces just like yours, shea buttered and loved up. And there are no precincts, just love temples that got spaces to meditate and eat delicious food. Mangoes, blueberries, nectarines, cornbread, peas and rice, fried plantain, fufu, yams, greens, okra, pecan pie, salad, and rice. Things that make your mouth water and your soul arrive. All the hungry bellies know warmth. All the children expect love. The grandmothers help you with your homework, practice yoga with you, and teach you how to make jambalaya and coconut cake from scratch. When you are willing out because your heart is broke or you don't have what you need, the grandmas take you by the hand and lead you to their gardens. There you can lay down amongst the flowers, her grasses, roses, dahlias, irises, lilies, collards, kale, eggplant, and blackberries. She wants you to know that you are safe and protected, universal, limitless, sacred, sensual, divine, and free. So give the police departments to the grandmother, grandmas. They are fearless, classy, and actualized, blossomed from love. They wear what they want and they say what they please. Believe that. There wouldn't be noise citations when the grandmas ride through our streets, blasting Stevie Wonder, Nina Simone, Marvin Gaye, Alice Coltrane, Jimi Hendrix, KRS-One, all that good music. The kid's gonna hula hoop to it and sell her lemonade made from heirloom pink lemons and maple syrup. The car is solar powered and urban footprint less. They design the technology themselves. At night, they park the cars in a circle so that they can all sit in them with the sunroofs down and look at the stars, talk about astrological signs and figure out what to plant tomorrow based on the moon's mood. And they'll help you memorize Audre Lorde and James Baldwin quotes. She always looks you in the eye and acknowledges the light in you with no hesitation, no fear. Grandma loves you fiercely forever. She sees the pain in your bravado, the confusion in our anger, the depth behind our coldness. Grandmas know what oppression has done to our souls and is going to change it, change it. one love temple at a time, and she has no fear. The second reading is Tomorrow I'll Wake by Jonathan Butler. And tomorrow I'll wake to the possibility of all the ways that a community can become a garden and mourn and hurt and love and heal just to come out on the other side of what was meant to bury us, radical and in bloom.
It's a little miracle if it survives. The tiny little egg on the leaf in the light of the moon, you know the book. It's a miracle, especially these days, if it survives from the presence of ants or spiders or a thousand other potential threats like a strong wind taking it away from its milkweed leaf. It's a little miracle if it survives, the monarch starting as a tiny egg and then a caterpillar very hungry and then a hanging jay and then a chrysalis, not a cocoon like in the book. So it continues on, persevering, sustained by inner wisdom and outer luck, like all of us are all the time. And after it forms its protective layer to create what it will become, the shell of what was fades away, it becomes translucent as you go out to check it each day, seeing what has changed. You've been keeping vigil on this little leaf, either in your garden or the little net on the porch, and to see how the chrysalis has changed, to see how close it's getting toward its new found freedom. And within a matter of just moments, you'll miss it if you're not careful. Just one day, like a little miracle bursting open, the thin, tiny layer of what held it breaks off, falls away. The wings, bright and colorful and growing, begin to spread as the monarch prepares to fly. And tomorrow, writes the poet, I'll wake to the possibility of all the ways that a community can become a garden and mourn and hurt and love and heal just to come out on the other side of what was meant to bury us, radical and in bloom. Each morning we seem to wake to possibilities that only yesterday or a few decades back, like in March, didn't seem possible. Each morning I seem to wake to the day wondering, hoping for a miracle cure or treatment to the pandemic. Early on I had dreams of the front of the post bulletin just saying cured, or a miracle cure or treatment to injustice or disparities, or a miracle cure or treatment for weary souls and hearts in an uncertain world. Each morning we wake, checking the news, checking our soul, checking the health and wholeness of the world and our own lives, wondering what is breaking this morning, like in the old hymn, like in the first morning, what bird song is singing like the first bird, what is being recreated in this new day. Things have been and continue to change in odd frames, juxtaposition of time, from slow to fast, from just sitting there in the chrysalis for days to all of a sudden translucent, breaking off, wings emerging. Or as one activist said about justice work just a few weeks ago, she wrote, I personally love how we all went from learning how to bake banana bread to learning how to abolish the police in a matter of weeks. Matter of weeks. What a matter of weeks. Sometimes it's a quick and a steep learning curve to keep up with it all. How to imagine a different world broken open in new ways. How to imagine a different way of being, of structuring this world that can hold us, hold us all in a love that is worthy of us all. When I was 17, I was traveling at a not so safe speed down a residential street in my hometown, North Mankato. As I passed a parked police car, my heart dropped. And as I saw his face and him quickly turn his lights on and whip the car around, my heart dropped more. I was shaking, I was terrified, I was silent, I was compliant. I stopped to the side of the road quickly. When he came up to my car, he looked at my license and he read it and said, Royer, Bruce's son? 
My father was a city employee. I knew all these officers, at least by name. Yes, sir. I'll just call your father. You slow down. Don't do it again, he said. And he let me go, and I very slowly drove away. And I know now in new ways this could have been otherwise. Perhaps if he didn't know my dad, perhaps if he felt threatened by me for whatever reason he could name or not, my look, my demeanor, perhaps if my skin was black or brown or my car was different, perhaps if he was different. And then this past week, fast forwarding a bit, in Rochester near our home, I was walking our dog. A black man walked past me and a few minutes Later, as I was turning a curve, I noticed a police car had stopped, and he got out of the car, and he came up behind this black man that was walking and started following him. And then, whizzing past down the street was another police car, and another, and another. And I began to get nervous the news cycle spiraling in my mind of these past several weeks. This man walking seemed to pose no threat to anyone around him at all. I did not know all the details, of course. Maybe they had been following him. Maybe there was a call from someone. I do not know. But what I do know is that I, with white skin and privilege, having police as friends or acquaintances of our family, I shook when the police approached me when I was 17. What I don't know is how this man in Rochester, with skin that had been profiled by police for centuries, felt about four police cars and then officers coming toward him. All was peaceful. Officers as non-threatening as can be coming out of a squad car with a uniform that hasn't always meant safety and a belt with a gun and a taser and handcuffs. It's kind of hard to seem non-threatening no matter who's in that uniform. And I breathed a sigh of relief when an ambulance came and he spoke with paramedics and the police backed off and he seemed to willingly, peacefully get in and it could have been otherwise. And that's the core of the problem. We live in a world where the system and history of policing has a record of excessive force and escalation, rooted in a system that was designed with slave patrols to round up property which were black enslaved people where you don't know which officer you're getting still, the kind community ethical servant or one with unrealized implicit bias and ingrained fear or active prejudice or anger that is guiding the, the interaction. You, you don't know who's coming in that uniform, in that squad car. I've had to really wrestle in my own mind and heart of what defunding or dismantling the police as we know it really looks and feels like. Knowing that I grew up with a trust of police, and yet when I was 17, I shook because I also knew something else could be threatening. That defunding or dismantling the police in the effort and conversation right now does not mean that all the work of individual officers is evil, but it does mean we have to reimagine how are we using our resources. We set up a false choice that defunding the police is about lessening our safety. That does not have to be true. Communal safety can and has been created in a thousand ways, with modern police forces being one version and a version that has become increasingly militarized. What does conventional wisdom claim that defunding the police is somehow anti-community when we have a history of defunding health care, defunding education, defunding mental health services, defunding social safety nets? We are a country with a track record of defunding basic human rights and access to healthy, safe communities all the time. 
What if this system that we are too quick to believe is the only thing that can possibly protect us was broken open? And we raised our hands together in community amidst the sneers and jabs and said, no, we can, we must, we will do better. We are creative. We are brilliant when we work together. What if we re supported the resources in our communities that attended the support and flourishing of our communities in new ways? That it lessened or eliminated the need of a militarized police force? Isn't that public safety? What if instead of police precincts, writes the poet, we had what the poet Wananda Petrus called love temples? those departments of grandmothers with some sweet rides offering care and allowing us to catch shame for wrongdoing, giving us what we need to do and be better, food and shelter and soul care rooted in love and actual resources that we need to flourish. What if we dispatched social workers and crisis intervention specialists, mental health professionals with no armor, no badge, but someone who knows how to get resources for someone sleeping on the bench in the park or along the Zumbro River or under the bridge on 16th Street. Who knows how we could do it differently? What if we dispatched people who knew how to de-escalate, trained in behavioral and mental health as their primary and only role to attend to someone in distress? with their only uniform being some polo shirt and a name tag, an immense love. What if we dispatched a department that showed up unarmed with any weapon other than social resources, informed compassion that knew how to hold trauma and redirect tension? As one organization writes, what if, instead of putting it all on a police officer's shoulders to figure this out, you could call or text about a drug overdose or domestic violence, and it connects you with someone that has resources for crisis intervention and safety. Or what if you're driving along and you have a tail light out and a city employee stops you and replaces it for you? Is that not public safety? The larger question is, how are we investing our resources the best way that we can? toward the world we most want? How are we taking the best of what the best police officers are doing and the best of what mental health professionals are doing and educators and medical professionals and emotional and spiritual and physical health experts are doing and have enough creativity and tenacity to imagine new ways of being together? to imagine new responses to public crises, to imagine what public safety looks like if we know that it doesn't have to be what it always has been. So when a public servant comes toward you, you don't have to question whether or not you should be afraid. How might we shed the container, break forth into something new, of what we always knew and thought was the only way, breaking that open into some new morning, some recreation of what we've always longed for and needed, awake to some different kind of freedom, a wider circle that is wider and wider still of well-being. What if we cultivated a community like a garden which is made of radical blossoming, of deep care, of justice, and of love.
I'm gonna lay down my sword and shield down by the riverside, down by the riverside, down by the riverside. I'm gonna lay down my sword and shield down by the riverside ain't gonna study war no 